Man, can you imagine with me for a moment the Apostle John writing the book of Revelation? See, Jesus himself gives John this majestic vision of heaven's courts, where Jesus is described as the Lamb of God who is worthy to be, receive blessing and honor and glory and power forever. Then Jesus gives John this vision of judgment that is going to be unleashed on the earth during the seven years of tribulation. Then, John, then Jesus gives John this vision. As John begins to write the book of Revelation, he gives him this vision of the final conflict that we know as Armageddon. Then Jesus gives John this vision of a new heaven and a new earth. And every time John begins to write, you see, this book of Revelation was written by this apostle John. And Jesus, then he gets very specific with John, gives him insights into seven different churches, to seven different letters that he's going to write to these churches. These seven letters that John wrote to the church not only were for the church of that time, but apply to us today. So I'm excited to jump into this brand new series called Dear Church. You see, these seven churches were doing some things right. You know what it's like to do some things right for God? You're like, man, like, I, I, like we don't get it right all the time, but when I do, it's like, yes. Like, like I, I made the right decision. I did the right thing. Well, these Seven churches, were, they were doing some things right, but they were also needed to be corrected on some things. Then they were needed to be given some counsel to be able to move forward. So today, the title of my message is The Forgetful Church. The Forgetful Church, and again, if you're visiting with us, my name's Mike. My wife Susie and I are the lead pastors. Just want to welcome you here on this Labor Day Sunday. Make sure to take that Connect card, take it out to the hub, and get your free gift. But before we jump into that first letter, I want to give you a little bit of a background on Revelation and the Apostle John. See, in Revelations is the last book in the New Testament, the last book in the Bible. And what it does is it looks to the future and all that God is going to accomplish. And just like all scripture and revelation, Jesus is the star. And the apostle John, as, as he's writing the book of Revelation, this is, this, again, the same John who wrote the gospel John. We have the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So the John that wrote the gospel John is the same John who wrote the book of Revelation. And again, the same John later in the uh, New Testament wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. So the year is anywhere between 90 and 96 A.D., this is about 60 years after Jesus' resurrection. Now, John is writing these letters. He's sitting here. He's, he's right now. He didn't have a nice fancy desk like this uh, because he was on an island. He, he, was, um, he was banished to the island of Patmos, and I believe we have a picture of it here. You can kind of see um, there is all of the um, seven churches that he was writing a letter to. And then, it's actually really hard to see, the bottom left-hand corner, it's kind of a little bit faded. It's a circle around it. says Patmos. That is the island that, um, that John was exiled to. And th he was there because he was being punished for his faith in Jesus. Now, you have to remember that all of the original disciples, they were martyred for their faith. They were martyred for sharing the gospel, except for John. Now, it wasn't for a lack of trying. They actually tried to martyr John. They, wa they wanted him dead. And history tells us that the emperor, Omission, tried to execute John. Get this. They put him in a cauldron of boiling water. Like it seems like a, kind of like a witch movie that you would watch. Like a, like a cauldron of boiling water. They put John in this. I'm like this will teach him. We're going to get rid of John. The problem was is that he didn't die. The problem was, is when they actually took him out of this boiling hot water, he did not have even a trace of a burn on him. And so they didn't know what to do with him, so they exiled him to this island of Patmos to stop him of spreading the gospel. 
Can you imagine being so on fire for Jesus, so dangerous to the kingdom of darkness, that the only way to shut you up, the only way to stop you from telling people about Jesus is to exile you to an island where there's nobody? Like, let's send John to an island where he cannot tell anybody else about Jesus. So when John writes this revela- what the book of Revelations, he's at least in his 80s. And this is how John begins writing the book. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. He reads this. He writes this. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to be blessed today. Not because I said so. Because God's word says so. Now I believe that we are blessed when we read any of God's word, the inspired word of God. But John is saying there's a different kind of blessing that happens. There's a different kind of blessing that comes with reading this prophecy, the book of Revelation. When you turn to the back, there's, some, there's a different kind of blessing, John says, when you read the book of Revelation. When you hear the word being preached of Revelation, it says when you hear aloud the words of this prophecy. There's a different blessing that comes with it. Revelation is filled with imagery that could cause one to be frightened or even scared. But Revelation is not meant to scare us, but it's meant to prepare us because Jesus is coming back for his church. Amen? So it's not meant to be scary. It's not to be like, oh, man, like I'm kind of worried. Like, no, no, it's it's meant to prepare us. Because here's here's the thing is we have some inside information on how it all ends. Right? Have you heard the term insider trading before? It's a term that applies to stock traders that are buying and selling stocks on the stock market, and they illegally acquire some information, say, regarding a company, usually a Fortune 500 company, and say they get some information that, you know, for whatever reason, that they're going to go bankrupt. And this stock trader gets the information before he's supposed to have it. And then he goes and he shorts the stock. So when they go bankrupt, their stock plunges, he's going to, you know, make millions. It's an illegal way of getting some insider information. He knows what's going to happen before it happens. We have some insider information, except it's not illegal to have yet. We have God's word. We can read and find out what happens At the end, and I'll give you a little tip, uh, we win. (laughs) Jesus wins, amen? So the goal of these letters that John is writing to these seven churches was to challenge, to encourage, but also to warn. And in these letters, Jesus reveals, he reveals what he loves, he reveals what he hates, what his standards are, and what he expects from us as believers and the church. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen, church? So his standards, his priorities, his expectations some 2,000 years ago when John wrote the book of Revelation is the same standards, the same expectations for us today. Now, most of the seven letters that were written to these seven churches have three parts to them. Not all the letters, but most of them. First, they'll have a commendation. It's like, boy, good job. This is what you're doing well, church. Like, hey, you're, you're nailing this part of a, being a believer. You're nailing this part of, of being a church. Good job. But then there's the correction part of, hey, this is what you need to change. And then some counsel on this is how you need to change it. It's a pretty loving way to approach, would you agree? So, but not in today's culture. Today's culture would disagree with you. Our culture says correction is hate. That if you disagree with me and how I live my life, my decisions, well, you're just a hater. Culture says to love me, you must go along with my behavior, my point of view, even my definition of truth. Even if it's rooted in delusions, lies, and wickedness. But church, that's not love. And it's certainly not biblical. Going along with someone's delusion, watching them drive off of a moral or spiritual cliff, is not love. Love corrects. Love counsels. 
And this is exactly what Jesus is doing through these seven letters to these seven churches. So I want to start off with Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, and I'll I'll explain it a little bit. Because here, Jesus, he's already given John this vision. And in, in verse 20, Jesus is actually explaining this vision to him. It says this, The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we have these lampstands here, and these lampstands represent the seven churches. There's a golden lampstand. Each one represents the church. Now, this word angel here, I want to I talk about this for a second. Um, this word angel, actually, when you, uh, when you translate it from the original Greek, it could be interchanged with the word messenger. And it says the stars are the angels, or could be translated messenger. Now, these messengers, or an- these messengers could actually be actual angels who are watching over the churches, but many scholars believe that it's actually more likely that these angels, that they, these are actually messengers, are pastors and leaders of the churches. Because it says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Again, most scholars believe that these actually should be interpreted messengers, and these messengers are pastors and leaders of the churches. And then you have the lamp stand, which represents the church. The churches are compared to a lampstand because we're called to carry the light of the world. The, these, these churches are represented, these are these lampstands, which we're called as believers, as the church. Like this should be us, carrying the light of the world. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Like we are called to be light in the darkness. So so John was, Jesus here when he's giving John this explanation saying like, hey, these lampstands where where you have a light, you kind of, you know, you don't hide the light, you put it on a stand so so it can kind of radiate as far as possible. He's like, these should be the churches. This, my light should be radiating from the church. So we have the stars, we have the churches, these lampstands that represent the church. So this sets up the first letter that was written to the church in Ephesus. Now, this church in Ephesus, Timothy is actually the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Now, this Timothy is the Timothy that Paul had mentored. Paul actually wrote two letters to Timothy as the pastor at these churches. We have it in the New Testament as two of the books, 1st and 2nd Timothy. So let's jump in to the letter that John writes to the church in Ephesus, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 to 3, says this, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up or labored for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. So this letter, John starts with accommodation. Like, good job. Like, like you're do- this is what you're doing well. I know your works, your toil, and your patiently enduring. He's saying, hey, you've worked hard. Like, like, I see that. You haven't been lazy. You haven't been sitting around doing nothing. Like, you guys have been doing some things. You've been getting some things done for the kingdom of God. And you've been patient. You've resisted sin. You've discerned and rejected false prophets. Like, good job. Like, there's false prophets out there. And you've been able to discern those that are false prophets. Good job. You haven't let sin come into the church. Good job. There are good things that you're doing. Now, let's talk about for a minute the city of Ephesus. Uh, I have another map, and it kind of shows the seven modern day, um, the seven churches um, on the left, and on the right, it kind of gives you, you know, um, Ephesus is in modern day Turkey, 
and the city of Ephesus was the fourth largest city in the known world. And it's um, still called Ephesus today. I actually looked it up. And it's still called Ephesus, but it's actually just in ruins. <clears throat> and again, it's in modern-day Turkey. And Ephesus had major trade routes. You kind of just see it just crumbles and it's in ruins. And, um, it had, uh, at, at that day, it, it was a thriving market. It had large stadiums and, and theater that could seat tens of thousands of people. It was a very influential city, but it was also an unrighteous and immortal city. There was a temple there dedicated to Artemis, and that's what's left of this um, temple, which was the goddess of fertility. It, but this, this temple was so impressive that it's actually one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. There, t- there, there was thousands of temple prostitutes all over this temple. On top of that, we had sorcery and witchcraft, demonic things being practiced there. It was a stronghold for Satan. Yet, with all of that opposition, the church was still able to keep evil out. And Jesus said, great job. Good job. See, Jesus is aware of your labor He sees what you do. He he notices everything that you do for the kingdom of God. But he also sees our shortcomings, as he did with the church in Ephesus. So here comes the correction part. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, John writes this. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love of God. That you had at first. They lost their first love. They lost their first love in Jesus. He says, you're doing some great things. You're getting some things done. You're keeping evil out. They're like sin away. You're you're identifying false prophets. Good job. But you've lost your first love. You've lost your first love. Yes, it's hard to believe. It's September 1st. And... In, in a few short months, we're going to be, you know, full out um, Christmas. And maybe, parents, you've given your son or daughter a Christmas gift. And they love that gift, especially when they're younger, kind of toddler, you know, probably, you know, ages 10 or under. And it was a toy. And, man, when, you, when they opened that toy on Christmas, they, they played with it. Like nonstop on Christmas Day. Like that whole, the whole week that they're home from school, off of school, they're playing with it every day. All right? And then January comes, and, and, you know, they're still playing with it, but just not as much. And then a couple weeks go by, and they're kind of playing with it, you know, every other day. And then a few months, it's kind of like, hmm, have you seen the, that toy that we got you? Like it's only March 1st, and, 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 and you haven't seen it. Like it's only been two months, three months, and, 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 the, and the toy's nowhere to be found. Because the child liked it at first and, and enjoyed it, but then its love for the toy just kind of began to fade. This is what happened to the church at Ephesus. Because they didn't start there. They at once had a love for Jesus. Because it says in, in verse 4, it says that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Like you had a love and a passion for me, Jesus says, but you've lost it. See, everything that we do as believers hinges on our love for Jesus. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, these these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. See, we can do all these things. We we can work, we can toil, um, we can speak eloquently, we can serve tirelessly, we can do all these things. But without love, it doesn't mean anything. Our love for Jesus needs to be the most important thing. The Ephesian church, they were doing great things, but they had this one serious flaw. That they'd abandoned their first love. They cared more about rules than they did relationship. 
They're more worried about following the rules of keeping sin out, identifying false prophets, you know, the, the witch and sorceries and everything that's going on. We're going to follow these rules. We're going to make sure. And, and like I said, like those were good things that they were doing, but they abandoned their love for Jesus. And I pray that it's never said of Mohawk Valley Church that we've lost our first love. Because you can have great intentions. You can have great doctrine. You can have great theology and understand everything in the Greek, Hebrew, and be able to translate it and speak it. But if you don't have love, it's for nothing. Our passion and our love for Jesus needs to be first and foremost. They were the forgetful church. See, sometimes we can get so caught up and being busy doing busy serving that we can abandon and forget our first love. And that's what it's all about, a passion and a love for Jesus. Our labor for Jesus should never eclipse our love for him. What's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love the Lord your God. So John is writing this letter. He goes through the commendation saying, hey, good job. Then he goes through the correction like, hey, this is what you've done wrong. But then he begins to write the counsel. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 5, John writes, remember therefore from where you have fallen. He's saying remember. Remember where you once were. Remember where the love that you had for me once was. Then repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. John is giving them the first step to restoring your first love, and that is to remember. To remember, remember the love that you used to have. Remember the love that used to burn for me. Moms and dads, husbands and wives, do you remember that first date? Do you remember those first weeks and months of that relationship? It was so new, it was so vibrant, it was so exciting Right, that maybe even those first few dates you had some butterflies in your stomach and, and you're kind of nervous and your hands were sweaty. You're like, I don't know if I should hold her hand because my hand is like completely wet. I'm so, it's all slippery because I'm so sweaty because I'm so nervous. I don't want to do the wrong thing. I don't want to say the wrong thing. And, and, it's just, and it's this you know, love that's beginning to blossom and there's just so much newness to it. But here's the thing is those butterflies and those excitement and that newness, it wears off and that's okay. But you have to work at it. Love is not just a feeling. It's not just an emotion. Love is a commitment. And so you have to work on that relationship. Because once those butterflies and nervousness goes away, and they're going to go away. Like a new relationship is, you know, it's only new for so long. Then all of a sudden when you take her out for dinner, you don't have that same butterflies in your stomach because you know her. You spent some time with her. You know what she likes and what she doesn't like. You know the restaurant to take her to and the one not to. So you're not nervous anymore. You don't have the butterflies anymore. That doesn't mean you don't love her. It means you got to work on it. You have to put some work into that relationship or, because if you don't, it will begin to fade. The same is true with our relationship with Jesus Over time, the excitement, the joy of being set free, delivered from your sin, can begin to fade. And we can forget about the feeling of being with Jesus, the feeling of having your sins forgiven, that moment when you prayed that prayer and he came into your life and set you free, that feeling will fade. But it's going to take some work to continue to foster that relationship between you and the Lord. Do you remember what it was like when you first loved Jesus? Do you remember the thrill? Do you remember the excitement of having your sins forgiven? 
where you couldn't wait to worship, where you couldn't wait to pray, where you couldn't wait to get into God's word, and, and you had a passion to go to church every week, and it was just, it was new, it was exciting. Jesus is saying, get back there. Remember what it was like. Remember what it, what it was like to have your sins, your life set free from sin and bondage. But that takes work. He's saying remember, but that's going to take some work. He doesn't stop, though, with remember. The second step to restoring your first love is repent. They're sorry, the second step is to repent. Worship team, you can go ahead and come back. Repent means to change direction, to go a different way. See, this letter to Ephesus was challenging them to change course. Like, hey, there's some correction. There's some things that you need to do. You need to change course. They were headed the wrong way, so you need to turn around. Maybe you're here, that, that's you today. You've forgotten your first love. So let me ask you, do you need to repent? Because here's the thing. Is Satan is a master at creating distractions. He'll distract you with work, your job, your career, the hours. He'll distract you with school, the assignments, sports, the, 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 the after-school programs, the activities. He'll, he'll distract you, parents, with your kids. He'll distract you. Maybe it's your finances. Things are tight or the opposite. Things are great. Got some extra money. Kids are out of the house. We're able to go and travel and do a lot more. He can distract you with money either way. He can be either tight or he can have a lot of it. He can distract you at both ends. He's going to distract you every way that he possibly can. As believers, we need to keep the candle burning. We need to keep it lit. We need to keep it going. And that happens through prayer. It's talking to the Lord. It's talking to Jesus. It's, it's, it's fostering a relationship. Wouldn't be much of a husband if I, all this week, didn't talk to Susie. Oh, we live in the same house. We even work in the same building. But I didn't talk to her all week. She'd be pretty upset, rightfully so. Prayer is talking to the Lord. We do it through getting in your word, reading God's word, attending church as the body of believers together. There's something powerful about coming together as the people of God, and it's going to take some work to foster that relationship, to foster that love. Have you seen an elderly couple? Have you walked into a restaurant before and seen an elderly couple sitting there? And you, you can just tell that they've been married for decades. Sitting there and they're holding hands, looking into each other's eyes. And you're like, man, there's some longevity there. There's some history. There's some experience. There's some commitment there. They're still in love. You know, uh, something that just touches my heart when I see the elderly saints of our church that pray and worship like it was yesterday that they gave their life to Jesus. Seeing them raise their hands in adoration of who God is. Think about people like Claire who's been attending our church. I won't give it away, Claire, because it's been a long time. But man, to see her heart to serve the Lord, to love Jesus like it was yesterday, let me tell you, that encourages me. It excites me to see people like you with a love that it seems like it was yesterday that, you, that he forgave you of your sins. Something about longevity and a relationship with the Lord. You see, as John was writing this letter, <laughs> he wrote this to the Ephesian church. And it wasn't just a letter because it, 
was the inspired word of God. Jesus was speaking through John as he writes. And that's why it's in the Bible, because it was inspired word of God. Which means it wasn't only for the church at Ephesus, but it's for us today. See, when Jesus is speaking through John on what to write, he had us in mind. He had you in mind. The forgetful church. Is that you today? You might not be the forgetful church, but maybe you're the forgetful believer. That you've lost your first love, your first passion. It's begun to fade over time. Your devotion has faded. Your pursuit of him has waned. But isn't it amazing that a letter written over 2,000 years ago today still applies to me and to you? So maybe you're here today, and that's you. Your love, your passion for Jesus has waned a little bit. Hasn't quite been where it should be. Or maybe you're sitting here and you're like, I've actually never had a relationship with Jesus. I don't know him. I've never surrendered my life to him. Well, I want to give you an opportunity today to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because as we begin to dive over these next several weeks into the book of Revelation, let me tell you, it could be scary. And if you're not a believer, then maybe you should be scared. But as believers and Christians, man, Jesus gives us a way out of all the judgment that's going to happen one day to this earth. Because he didn't want you to go through it. So he sent Jesus because he loved you so much. He sent Jesus to the cross to die for your sins. I want everyone to go ahead and stand to your feet today. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes all across this place. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. So maybe that's you today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, that you would say, I need to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If that's you, I just want you to go ahead and slip your hand up. Say, yeah, that's me. I need to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Go ahead and slip your hand up all over this place. I see the hands going up. Amen. Amen. I want everybody, you can put your hands down. What I want to do is I want to pray this sinner's prayer, but I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I need a Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross and rising again. Give me a new start. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. The second response, though, is for those that have called, that already call themselves Christians. You've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but maybe, just maybe, your love for him has waned a little bit. You're not, you're not passionately in love with Jesus as you once were. I want everyone to go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes again. And if that's you, they say, you know what, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, but my love for the Lord has just waned a little bit. It's, it's not where it needs to be. I just want you to slip your hand up right now if that's you all across this place. Say, you know what, it's just slipped a little bit. I, I, I need to get, I need to remember, as John said, hands are going up all across this place. Amen. You can put your hands down. I'm going to pray and We're going to have prayer team, two prayer teams up here on either side of the stage. And if you need prayer for anything, we're going to sing a last song together. If you need prayer for anything, whether it's something to do with this message or maybe it has nothing to do with this message, then 
we want to make that available to you. We're going to have two prayer partners on either side of the stage, and they're going to be there to pray for you during this last song. But, man, I just want to pray over you, and then we're going to sing this together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, help us to remember our first love, that we would never forget what you've done for us. Lord, that we would work on our relationship with you. Lord, we would cultivate, Lord, a passion for you. And Lord, if we need to repent, Lord, help us to recognize that we need to repent and change course. Lord, that we would pursue you with everything that we have, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.